Chapter 13. A Big Problem. Well, what is it? I cried. What is his crime? Cruelty, whispered Snout. I felt my stomach tighten. Cruelty, I asked, wondering if I had heard right. In the civilised galaxy, cruelty is the greatest of all crimes, said Madame Pong. Of course, life always involves some suffering, and there are times when painful things must be done for life to continue. But an intelligent being, who takes pleasure in causing pain to others, while well, such a being is considered dangerously bent. You must understand, said Targibbons, that empathy is the heart of civilization. Empathy. The ability to understand what another feels, said Snout. It is the trait that lifts us above the animals. Speak for yourself, burped Phil. You know what I mean, said Snout smoothly. An intelligent being who lacks empathy is a threat to the social order. Not caring what pain it causes, it may do damage beyond estimation. Causing needless suffering is a sickness, and those who do so are forever outside our law. I had a sudden sinking feeling. I knew why Earth had not yet been invited to join the League of Worlds. If you've watched the evening news more than once, I'm sure I don't have to explain. Just how cruel is this guy? I asked, hoping that if cruelty was a crime, squashing bugs against the heads of innocent kids might be enough to get BKR in the kind of trouble that would send the Galactic Patrol across the galaxy to capture him. Millions have wept, murmured Madame Pong. That didn't sound good. But what has he done? I persisted. That is classified information, snapped Gracker, giving me a sudden desire to hit him on the head. Rudd, if he kidnaps someone from your family, you can be sure that at least part of his motive will be to cause you pain and suffering, said Tar Gibbons. But what will he do to them? I persisted. Nothing if we can stop him in time, said Snout. Where are your mother and siblings now? They should be at home. Oh dear, said Madame Pong. I think that simple phrase was the most frightening thing I had yet heard yet. Back to the Albright residence, shouted Gracker. Aye, aye, Captain Meathead, burped Phil. My stomach lurched as the ship made a sharp turn and then shot forward. Hurry, I cried, hurry. We're there, said Gracker. How much faster do you want us to go? We're there, but we just started. Then I blushed. We were in a spaceship. The three miles from the Becker house to my house might have taken a quarter of an hour on my bike, but that was no reason to expect the same of the good ship Furkle. Snout, called Gracker. Do a bioscan. See if you can detect any life forms in the house, especially those of the Albright lava. Snout closed his eyes. The end of his snap began to quiver, as if he were trying to smell the twins. I detect one humanoid life form, he said at last. Mum? I cried. No, not your mother, nor is it BKR. This is someone unfamiliar to me. I felt a little chill. Who could it be? I asked. We'll have to go down and find out, said Gracker grimly. While Phil landed the furco in the apple tree behind the house, Gracker handed me a wide belt. Strap this on, he said. What is it? Rocket pack. Standard issue, same as I use. Basically an anti-gravity belt with thrusters for control. Use the buttons on the front to direct yourself. Madame Pong looked worried. Gracker, do you think... Madam, he said, holding up a green hand, this is a captain's decision. Rod must accompany us, and the belt is the only efficient way for him to do so. She closed her eyes and nodded her head. Then she turned to me and said, Be careful, young one. I hadn't really been worried until she did that. Now I felt nervous indeed. 
Be careful of what? I asked. Of flying, of surprises, of cruelty. My thoughts will be with you. Just your thoughts? Aren't you coming along? This is a scouting mission, said Cracker. I need you because you know the territory. Tar Gibbons will accompany us in case we need his fighting skills. Snout, please perform a training transfer. Before I could ask what a training transfer was, Snout had placed his long fingers at the sides of my head. Close your eyes, Rod, he whispered, standing as close as he could without jamming his long face into mine. And whatever you do, don't move. I did as he asked. He began to hum. Suddenly my mind was filled with an image of the control panel at the front of the rocket belt. How did you do that? I cried, pulling away from him. Instead of answering, he screamed and fell to the floor. What happened? I cried. What is it? He told you not to move, snapped Gracker, kneeling beside the fallen alien. With a gentleness that surprised me, he lifted Snout's head into his lap. But he startled me, I said weakly. Warrior mind must deal with surprise more fluidly, said Tar Gibbons, sticking its head over my shoulder. Snout had his hands crossed over his eyes. He was moaning softly. Your sudden move broke the connection that poor Snout had established, explained Madame Pong. That breaking must be done slowly and gently, otherwise much pain can ensue. I felt terrible. I'm sorry, I said, kneeling beside Snout and touching his hand. His long fingers closed over mine. The skin felt like fine leather stretched over sticks. No matter, he muttered, no matter. See to the children. Come, earthling, said Gracker, getting to his feet. Madame Bong will take my friend to the healing table. We must move on to the task at hand. To my surprise, I saw a tear trickle down his green cheek. It left a glistening trail in its wake. I'm sorry. I said again, feeling helpless. Snout tightened his grip on my hand. You made a mistake. Forgiveness is granted. The pain will pass. It is not the pain of cruelty. Forget me. Save the children. I stood. Gracker and Tar Gibbons led me to an exit in the side of the ship. The door opened. I looked down and nearly fainted. I had climbed this old tree plenty of times, and I knew it well. I had often stood on this very branch. It was about twelve feet above the ground, but now that I was only two inches high, about a thirtieth of my normal height, I felt as if I was standing at the edge of a skyscraper. Go ahead, said Gracker. Jump. I didn't move. Jump, or I'll have to push you. We have no time to waste. Gracker, wait, said Tar Gibbons. We can't be sure that the training transfer was effective, especially since the warning came too late. Gracker had already given me a push. A small push, to be sure, just enough to knock me off the branch. Screaming, I hurtled toward the ground so far below.